Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Today in the second episode of our reInvent series, we're joined by Gino Choi, Assistant Professor of Computer Science at Emory University. Gino participated in the conference's AI Summit, presenting on ELIT, which is short for Evolution of Language and Information Technology, which is a cloud-based NLP platform. In our conversation, we discuss some of the key NLP challenges that Gino and his group are tackling, including language parsing and character mining, as well as their vision for ELIT, which makes it easy for researchers to develop access and deploy cutting edge NLP models to the cloud. If you're hearing this on Wednesday, I'm currently at NeurIPS. If you're also here, please join the listener meetup I'm hosting tonight at 6.30 at Tavern Midway. Be sure to RSVP via the social activities thread in the conference's Whova app. Next week, I'll be in Seattle at KubeCon. I'd love to connect with any listeners in the area or in attendance. Feel free to shoot me a message via at Sam Charrington on Twitter, via email, or the Twomo website. See you around. And now, on to the show. All right, everyone. I am here with Gino Choi. Gino is an assistant professor of computer science at Emory University. Gino, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me. <laughs> uh, for sure. So we are uh, sitting here in Las Vegas. Uh, the occasion that brought us together is the reInvent conference here, uh, where you delivered a presentation on some of the work that you're doing at Emory. Uh, but before we dive into that, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved in machine learning. Right. So I actually got into the natural language processing back in 2002. So that's when I was doing my master's degree at University of Pennsylvania. And um, so I've been always interested in studying languages and having the language understanding um, by computers. So um, it, since I was young, I was always telling my mom that I wanted to make a robot that understands me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guess I'm stepping towards to that goal still. And I don't know if it's going to happen before my time or not, but I'm going to try to strive to it. So um, so uh, once I actually got into this field, I was fascinated by all these machine learning approaches. The machine is capable of learning the patterns that we don't really even teach. And it actually gets pick up the patterns that we don't even think about, so especially with the latest um, technologies with deep learning and neural networks. Uh, it's actually started discovering some linguistic phenomena that is not, has not been really discovered by humans yet. So this is actually a very exciting time of the year um, to study natural language processing along with machine learning. What are the research areas that you focus on uh, in your work? Right, so uh, there are many different fields in natural language processing that I do, but um, the core there are like mainly three projects I work on. One is the core level uh, natural language processing, what we call given a like unstructured raw free text, we try to analyze the text into structures. So this is uh, all prototypical things that you learn from the elementary school. So you analyze the language into grammatical categories, synthetic patterns, semantic processing, and some understanding. So we now try to have um, computers to generate the similar structures that we have been teaching in the decades. So that's the one part of the research I work on, which we call as a language parsing. Mm -hmm. And the second part is we also try to show how the language represent. So especially we are trying to present this into the setting of the machine comprehension. So the project that I actually created since I came to Emory was uh, it's the project called Character Mining. And the goal of the project is to understand human conversation involving multiple parties. So now the scenario I'm designing right now is if you have a machine such as like Alexa um, or any of these client um, a conversation agent machines, um, it can just listen to our conversation 
and later on if we actually forget some contents about this conversation we can instead of calling like multiple people around about this we can ask the machine um so what did i talk about uh what did i talk about this <laughs> and if i forgot your like last name so what was uh -huh. sam's last name it should be able to tell if that kind of content was brought up during the conversation so that's one project I call character mining. That's what okay. I work on most. And also along the application side, since Emory has a huge hospital, we have so much records, years of years of uh, data from patients and all these different kind of electronic healthcare um, data. So we actually also try to apply natural language processing to help people to facilitate better for their uh, medical needs. So especially we, what we have done is we have tried to done the classification of the radiology reports and see um, the machine is capable of seeing what kind of severity level of this patient has based on the um, text in the report. And I think we have been reaching to the similar accuracy as humans do. So that's what the technology is evolved. And also another um, new project that we start working on is given the um, language patterns or you basically um, ask the person to speak freely about certain things about one or two minutes and we analyze the style of the language or some patterns of the language and um, we can detect if the person has some kind of cognitive impairment and leading to the Alzheimer's disease. So we are actually trying to catch a very early stage of Alzheimer's disease by using our language technology and this has been actually a working really exciting project for me. Oh wow. So, uh, that, there's a lot of interesting stuff to, yes. to, to, to dig into. So the the first one that you talked about is kind of language parsing. And mm -hmm. that's, we have have a, a long history of trying to do this with computers, mm -hmm. um, you know, both using kind of more traditional rules, model-based approach to, mm -hmm. to doing it. And more recently, um, statistical-based approaches to, to doing it. What are the kind of the main elements of the the way that you're going after this problem. Right, so during my PhD, I graduated from my PhD in 2012, which is not that long ago. But <laughs> <laughs> amazing thing is uh, um, every approach I actually learned during the PhD actually has changed it. Okay. <laughs> so uh, one side story, one sad story about this is I, when I came to Emory, I spent a year to make like slides for my uh, natural language processing graduate level class. Uh -huh. um, that was year 2015, and okay. I cannot use any of those slides anymore. <laughs> <laughs> because technology evolves so much, uh, which is a great thing uh, for the field. But right. For faculty members like us, we just have to keep <laughs> making new slides every year. Well, I mean, it's a happy thought. But um, so the latest um, breakthrough, I have to say, is a neural network and deep learning. Mm -hmm. So it's... Um, at the moment, we are trying to rely on the supervised learning, which you need to require enormous of amount of manually annotated data from the linguist. And you uh, basically, the machine tried to learn the patterns uh, among the human annotation and try to produce a very similar result uh, mm -hmm. for the unseen data. So this approach has been working for year, uh, over 20 years in natural language processing. Lately, um, because of this evolvement of neural network, we can actually use a lot of unsupervised data. So free text without human annotation can actually take a huge role into this field now. So all of a sudden, let me give you a very solid example. So there was a um, synthetic parsing task is one of the tasks that natural language processing field has been investigated for a long time. And um, the accuracy of 92 or 93 percent was the barrier that has not been, had not been broken for over 15 years. Mm. And after this neural network, in, so it got broken up to 96% now. As of like last month, one of my pitches soon actually um, broke the record to the 96%, which is something that we couldn't even dream of just two years ago. Wow. So um, yeah, I think all this involvement of the deep learning and machine learning technology really played a huge role in natural language processing. Mm -hmm. And so is there a particular type of model or model, model architecture that uh, you're using to... Uh, to do the syntax parsing? Right, so um, there are multiple different ways of doing it. So, but, um, so for parsing, there are two main streams of parsing. One is known as a transition-based parsing, and there is known as graph-based parsing. 
So in old days, just like in, it's not even old days, in five years ago, a lot of people <laughs> uh, focus on the transition-based parsing approach, mm -hmm. which is which doesn't search for the entire uh, search spaces, uh, entire um, possibilities, but it actually prunes out a lot of search space so it will run much faster. And speed is really essential for the big data analysis. So mm -hmm. everyone was going for transition-based parsing. What was actually amazing was um, now we, because of all this um, power of the GPU, which is known for parallel processing, mm -hmm. even if we actually make an exhaustive search using graph-based parsing, it can actually uh, still run as fast as a transition-based parsing. Mm. So this actually is another movement that I didn't actually dream of during my PhD time. Mm. But now my students actually are discovering graph-based parsing, which usually is more accurate, it now can even run as fast. So the algorithm is basically making the exhaustive search and given all the possible um, probabil probabilities, now you can re-rank to find the best structure out of it. Mm -hmm. So, which is getting much more popular approaches these days. And so in that, uh, in that model, in the graph-based mm -hmm. processing, What's what are the nodes of the graph? Nodes of the graph is the individual word, and the right. the connections. The connections will be uh, what we call dependency relations. So okay. like subject object um, preposition relations. So if you have a simple sentence like John bought a car. Mm -hmm. So John is a subject of but, and mm -hmm. car is an object of but, um, and all is a determiner of car. Mm -hmm. So that kind of relation is the synthetic parsing. You start with just nodes, then, right? Because right. The, the problem that you're trying exactly. to solve is to find what the, the what connections the connections are. are. So right. now, in this example, there are four words: mm -hmm. John bought a car, and so you have four nodes, and you have one extra node called root root of the sentence. So it, it depends on your approach, but root of the sentence in this case will be a but. So bot will be connected to root, mm -hmm. and everything else will have a connection to itself. So the current approaches that we are uh, developing is uh, you try to find if every pair will be compared if there is a relation. Mm -hmm. And now you run the optimi optimization algorithm to find which is the most probable tree you will um, generate out of this. And you're doing this via neural network? And now we are doing this in neural network, yes. Is it a supervised learning problem? Or? Um, at the moment, it's, um, so I would say like the most latest approaches are semi-supervised. Okay. So we do use all the training data from the human annotation, mm -hmm. but we also may take advantage of unstructured data, unannotated data. Mm -hmm. So this is the, um, well, everyone uses NLP called word embeddings. Yeah. So this word representation is trained on among a large amount of data. So the data that we have is about 62 gigabytes of the text. Mm -hmm. So 62 gigabytes of text is actually equivalent to so much more if you compare to like images mm -hmm. because it's only the character level. Right. So um, yeah, and we can actually learn all the all the what's the best representation for this word out of all this text and apply that knowledge into this supervised learning fashion. Mm. So, and so that that means so then each of the nodes mm -hmm. then isn't uh, a symbolic representation of the word, rather it's an embedding mm -hmm. that has some semantic space. Right, what well, we call or, distributional semantics. Okay, distributional yeah. semantics, semantics, right. Exactly. And so this, this corpus that you described, the 62 mm -hmm. gigabytes, is that uh, your own corpus or is now, that like glove vectors or something like it's that? It's all publicly available. So the most um, popular one, uh, the entire Wikipedia is available okay. to everyone. Amazon wonderfully um, released all, all their review, a lot of um, like 10 years of their review the reviews. And text. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have those. We have a lot of Twitter data too, okay. as well. And um, there are some medical domain Wikipedia that you can crawl. Okay. Um, and so those are also in there too. Okay. So in a, and also, um, there is also New York Times corpus from LDC. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's actually you have to buy from the organization, but we have it, so we all are also using it. Can you describe kind of the algorithm and the way that you're using embeddings and kind of the the network architecture that that you're sure. using and and how you're training these models to ultimately 
produce these these graphs? Right. Um, so in the very low level, the generations were already embedding. There are like so many different approaches coming out. It's basically you try to develop a language model. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, for given each all this text, for every word in the text, you are basically trying to build a model that actually can predict the contextual words. Mm -hmm. So you can go the other way too. Given the contextual word, you can try to predict that word of the target. Okay. So once you develop this kind of language model, and you can develop in many different ways. So mm -hmm. um, the most popular approach called word to vec is just using a very simple feed for neural network with mm -hmm. just one layer. Um, but the latest approach that people are using is more complicated as a bi-directional LSTM kind of approaches, which mm -hmm. tends to give better, uh, higher accuracy, but it's probably slower. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, given this language model, the language model tells you this word, for this word, this is the best re um, vector representation of the word. So now every word will be represented as a vector. So given that, now we um, pair um, we tokenize every word into sentences, and for every pair of word in the sentence, you try to see if there is a, a dependency relation or not. And that's the supervised fashion. Um, so now we have a large corpus, about 2.5 million words corpus, that actually has been annotated for this kind of dependency relations. So mm. um, the And is that the annotation is it contextual or is it like n-gram? Uh... It's, it's a contextual. Okay. It's an actual text. So okay. a lot of uh, the most famous one, what everyone knows in the field of NLP is the called Pantry Bank. Pantry Bank. Uh, so sure. that's the one million uh, words one. Uh, after that, there is another project called Antunot, which is um, What's big What's it called? Antunot. So okay. it's um, yeah, O N Antu O N T O Note. Okay. So this is also a, another project, and it actually has 2.5 million words. Okay. In, so it's a bigger corpus with much more genre. So Pantry Bank was only for the Newswire, but Antino's project had the broadcasting conversation, broadcasting news, telephone conversation, web blogs, okay. and even the Bibles. So mm -hmm. um, it has much more different kind of genres. It's a bigger corpus. And we also internally have um, some of this annotation on the medical domain as well. Mm -hmm. So all this combined together is making a supervised learning. Okay. So that's kind of the graph model. Mm -hmm. The you also mentioned the transition model, right? Um, which confused me at first because when I think of graphs, I think of transitions as these right. connections between yeah. the nodes. But it, it sounds like what that—that's more of like a. Uh, I don't know if you'd call it stateful or stateless, but like you're mm -hmm. looking at the current word right. in time right. as opposed to the entire exactly. relationships between everything. And you, you're you trying to. You got that exactly right. Okay. Yeah. So, graph based algorithm, it basically doesn't take in um, each node as an individual state, it just uh, take a whole holistic view of the entire graph. Mm -hmm. um, the transient based parsing, however, uh, is um, looking a word at a time. Mm -hmm. So it's making the transition between one word to the other word right. and try to see if um, there are some word, contextual words around it has the dependency relations. Mm -hmm. So that's how the transition-based parsing works. And the advantage of transition-based parsing is the parsing complexity is much lower. Mm -hmm. So um, we have, I've, we, uh, many people actually have written several papers about the parsing and complexity on average can be as low as the big O of N. Um, so basically, if you have n number of words in a sentence, um, you need to make about n number of comparisons to be done. Okay. Whereas graph-based parsing, you have to make n square uh, comparisons. Mm -hmm. So that's why transient-based parsing use uh, is uh, tend to be much faster. Mm -hmm. um, so and but because it's not comparing every um, possible pairs, uh, it tends to be a little less accurate. Mm -hmm. So, but people were um, buying the speed over accuracy for a long time period. So I also focused a lot on the transition based parsing in the past because of the efficiency reason. But these days, because of this GPU, now comparing n number of things versus n square actually is not that much different. Okay. And because everything is done in parallel now. Mm -hmm. So graph based parsing, um, I couldn't even believe, but <laughs> it actually is uh, performing as fast as a transition-based parsing. Okay. So. And was the transition-based parsing also 
being done with neural networks? Um, it can be trained on the neural networks. Okay. So transition versus graph is uh, um, depending on the parsing algorithm. So mm -hmm. it's a different the way a different way of processing the text, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and once you define your parsing algorithm, you can use any kind of machine learning algorithms. Okay. So you can use as easy as like logistic regression, like one layer, um, simple, or support vector machines in old days. Mm -hmm. But now everyone is moving on to um, using neural network to. Um, take advantage of the more accurate deck. Uh, and so that that's the uh, the language parsing mm -hmm. uh, piece, and then the um, I can't even read my own handwriting. <laughs> character mining. Character Is that mining. What you call yes. It? Yes. <laughs> 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 well, it's an unusual title too. So yeah. yeah. And so character mining. This, so you you describe this. If I'm remembering the the scenario, like mm -hmm. you've got two or multi parties in a conversation and you're trying mm -hmm. to basically have the machine understand what there is mm -hmm. like a machine comprehension right but it's it's like a third party comprehension you're trying to comprehend exactly. a dialogue exactly so yeah i want to uh, thanks for pointing that out actually you understood this correctly <laughs> so um i yeah i want to distinguish this project versus like a uh, traditional other uh, what everyone is going for as a conversation agent. That's mm -hmm. like a conversation between the agent, the computer agent right. and the human. That's not my goal. It's right. just, I want to have a third party agent that's listening to our conversation. Mm -hmm. And if we need something that if we are missing from this conversation, it can actually. So the best application for this kind of approach is maybe in your business meeting. So business meeting, uh, you always have a secretary um, writing notes for you, mm -hmm. and this conversation, um, this character mining project actually can really help to automate the process. Or like if you had some um, birthday party you know, with your son last time, and you forgot what kind of toys you were gonna buy for him, uh, and then. And you you are pretty embarrassed to ask to your son about it. Then you can ask to this to assist. Right, yeah, right. So they can save you <laughs> for all your embarrassment as well. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if it's a good application or a bad <laughs> application, but I'm imagining all kinds of domestic uh, applications between mm -hmm. husbands and wives. Uh, Alexa, who said they were going to buy the milk? I know. I know. If <laughs> well, they... actually, Sam, you said you were going to buy the milk. Right. You have a hard proof, right? <laughs> So, I mean, all this privacy issue actually will come out. So I, I don't imagine people would like it to be listening to you all day. All the time, yeah. Right? <laughs> but I mean, like our conversation, like uh, the interview like this, it's a perfect situation. Right. If the machine is listening to us, and if later on I want to actually make sure if I said things right, uh -huh. <laughs> I, I, can, I, I, I don't have to bother you, right? I can just ask the machine to... Mm. The word character there, mm -hmm. what is, is... Character is um, people. Okay. The, uh, character as a people. Mm -hmm. So the project actually is rather fun because it's actually my students' favorite project. Whenever they come to my lab, uh, research lab, they always want to work on this project instead okay. of some other ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's a more high-level um, project. But um, So I started this because I, I believe... Um, conversation data is going to be the key to natural language understanding in the future. Mm. So uh, I have a kind of evidence for this too, because how often do you text? All the time. All the time. Right? You can't <laughs> even count, right? But how often do you, so compared to email, right? Right. Email, you probably pretty frequently, but not as much as text. But if you think about like blogging, mm -hmm. even Twitter stream. Mm -hmm. Right, all these things what people ha are focusing on to do the data mining doesn't even come close to the conversation you're making on the text. Mm -hmm. So conversational data, the amount of the conversation data is growing way way faster than any other type of the data. But mm -hmm. natural language processing is one of the genre that NLP is missing so much. Okay. So yeah, NLP does very well. Um, for newswire kind of formal data, mm -hmm. or also even like a Twitter kind of social media data, people have been investigating for past ten years. So they are doing very well for those domains at the moment. But conversation data is still hugely lacking. Mm. That's why this Alexa challenge, uh, Alexa Prize, this kind of challenge is a very challenging task. And what's the Alexa Prize? Oh, Alexa Prize is. Uh, <laughs> uh, so is we're that, in the. 
<laughs> <laughs> We're in the the Wynn uh, or one of the Wynn hotels, and what are you looking for? Uh, okay, oh, you okay, can stop. Alexa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> stop, Alexa. Stop. <laughs> It's not there yet. <laughs> so I've just muted it again. Uh, so we're in the, the Wynn Hotel, and some folks may remember that a couple of years ago, I think it may have been here at a reInvent, uh, Amazon and the Wynn Hotels announced that they were putting uh, an Alexa in every hotel room. Uh, and so <laughs> Really? They did? <laughs> that, yeah, that's just part of oh, the hotel room. Oh, so you didn't bring this. No, no. It, it was it, a part of the hotel. <laughs> it's actually pretty awesome. Alexa, open the drapes. Oh my god. <laughs> That's pretty cool, isn't it? Home automation. Yeah. Hotel automation in this case. Yeah. So yeah, um, Alexa Prize is a competition that um, allows researchers to show, show off their research um, skills on the conversation agent. Okay. So they had a huge competition and uh, one of my colleagues from Emory actually participated and they were very close to win the third place. I think they won fourth place. Oh, wow. So they were not one of the fin finalists, but um, yeah, I, next year probably. And yeah. what's the problem problem formulation of the Problem uh, formulation is um, you're supposed to be so there are many judges for this okay. um, competition and you each judges basically talk freely in open domain um, it's not necessarily even questions you're just trying to make a conversation with the uh, Alexa and uh, if judge feels it actually is in the into the level of the satisfaction they give some kind of scores and they um, gather all those scores to see who actually has the best model mm. so it's it's open-ended, kind of like gymnastics in the Olympics. You're trying to impress the judges right. with what Alexa can exactly. understand. Oh, wow. That's, exactly. that's, and it sounds like it's an ongoing it is on, it's prize? Been, it's been there for... I know it's been there at least for two years. Um, I think it's been... And I know they're going to do again for sure next year. Mm -hmm. uh, the first year um, was... The winner of the competition actually gets $1 million. So oh, wow. it's a serious deal. Oh, and yeah. From the faculty point of view, it's not just a prize, but it's also a very intellectually challenging problem too. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. Plus, I mean, they actually give out the support for AWS um, cloud computing and also the PhD students if you are selected as one of the top eight uh, teams. So. You were talking about how we've got all this news. Uh, you know, we've have a, a mature set of practices for applying this mm -hmm. type of analysis to to news. Mm -hmm. We've got kind of these news data sets. We're much further behind mm -hmm. in conversational. Mm -hmm. Is it like a chicken and an egg kind of problem? Like we don't have the data sets because we haven't been working on it as hard. And, and so, I mean, I think it was basically based on the initial interest of the okay. NLP. So initially, as I mentioned, the Pantry Bank was the largest corpus uh, that we had for a while. Mm -hmm. um, it's not anymore, but it's still one of those initial uh, tree bank that was um, that allow us to do any meaningful statistical based natural language processing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think it, their intention originally was to analyze news data. So that's why they chose the genre of the news. Um, if they chose the genre of like conversation data, it would have been probably gearing toward to that side. Yeah. But I mean, I, government had their own reasons, right? So, and the tricky part about the conversation data, though, would you be willing to give out your text data to other people? I was thinking about this as where as you're describing this, like mm -hmm. you know, if yeah, I'm thinking about like what kind of incentive system, right. you know, some app might have to put into place so that, right. you know, a user would buy into the idea of using this messaging system, right. knowing that they were sending all their data someplace. That's right. a tough ask. Yeah, yeah. so, <laughs> I mean, I even tried to ask my own students. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually even like try to sign up some kind of form to them that I will not reveal this data to anyone else. Uh -huh. uh, but I mean, there were actually students who were willing to just give to me, but um, most of them said no, obviously. Yeah. So the, that was the first barrier. We couldn't find a good large amount of data that has convers a human conversation. Mm -hmm. So the closest data that we found um, is um, Twitter. Actually, coming from the TV shows. 
Mm. So we um, got the 10 years of the transcript from the show called Friends, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which... Uh, so that show does have some use. <laughs> exactly. And um, basically everyone knows that show and they're making reruns for another 10 years now, right? Wow. So um, we actually made an effort to... Um, make the transcript uh, it was transcript actually was done by all the fan based okay and, but we uh, none of them was structured so we actually had to spend a year to make the data structurized um, after that um, we have a clean uh, a fairly clean data for this script and we particularly liked this show because this show is not talking a particular thing it's, it's just not a, jargon it's just exactly life it's an everyday life yeah. from people um but um so that's why we chose this over some other shows yeah um, so even that um is involving a lot more like humorous sarcasm right and so it's so when we talk right now so we don't make so as much humor or sarcasm or all these metaphors they intentionally do so much time so mm. people think these scripted languages are actually easier to process but they're actually harder because mm -hmm. of all these reasons so anyway so we have that data now and given that data the first experiment we ran is is it possible to tell, like when you talk, when these people are talking to each other, is it possible to tell who is talking to others? Or if, say, so one of the characters in the friends named Ross, um, he had his sister also in the show called Monica, and they are, um, Ross and Monica are talking together, and they're talking about their mom and dad. And their mom and dad actually appear in some other episodes. So we were trying to experiment, is it possible when they talk mom and dad, if the machine will be able to figure out who that mom actually is. Mm. So, so like entity disambiguation? So, uh, so what we call entity linking. Entity exactly. linking, okay. Entity disambiguation is also the right terminology. So yeah, so basically you have to um, listen to the entire show, pretty much the entire show. Mm -hmm. But usually uh, those people are going to appear within the next few episodes, so you don't have to search that much. Mm -hmm. But you still, uh, your search space is still out of like 400 characters. Mm -hmm. Out of 400 characters, which one of these is mom, uh, Ross's mom, Monica's mom? So, um, so that's the first task we ran. And we actually even ran the um, international, uh, what we call semi veils the semantic evaluation task mm -hmm. uh, last year. And I think it was well received. A lot of people get uh, very much interest. And I'm still getting a lot of requests from the people too. So that was the first task. We need to figure out like who these people are talking about, right? <laughs> so that was the first part of the character mining project. Mm -hmm. So second part, uh, second task that we tackled. And if I can just ask mm -hmm. a question about that, you're doing that in a totally model-free way. It's all happening with a kind of a flat algorithm as opposed to pre-processing to identify people mm -hmm. and then remembering the people that are talked about and mm -hmm. kind of linking. It's, it's not that, it's like mm -hmm. just... Uh, right. Running, you know, kind of training a, a neural network on this, exactly. and then having the neural network, you you send in a sentence, and right. having the neural network point you to the the sentence that refers back to the people that you're talking about. It could be so. For okay. For example. For example. Exactly. So, so it's actually mm -hmm. different from traditional uh, entity linking task, which is also known as a wikification. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> wikification is another entity linking test, much more well known, which is uh, given like a name like Lincoln. Mm -hmm. uh, you find a Wikipedia page uh, for that link. So, you have to do some disambiguation as well. Lincoln can be Lincoln Hall or Lincoln Bridge mm -hmm. or actually Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln. Town Car. Yeah, so, so many different Lincolns, right? So, that about uh, those tasks has significant advantage that all those entities are already well known. Mm -hmm. So you already have some good knowledge base established for these entities. Right. But for this show, we don't have any of this knowledge. Uh, we are not assuming any of this knowledge base. Basically, the machine has to listen to these conversations and figure out if there's a link between these mentions. Mm -hmm. So it's a much more challenging task, as okay. in sense. Yeah. Okay. And so you talked about another couple of projects, the mm -hmm. uh, kind of what I have is what I got out of that was like interpreting structure and kind of semi-structured reports like medical reports oh yeah right? yeah yes uh, and then another one which is a really interesting application mm -hmm. of identifying 
the early indicators of um, cognitive impairment through mm -hmm. speech. Mm -hmm. um, but as we're kind of coming up on the end of our time here, I did want to ask you about one of the presentations you gave here at reInvent about uh, this NLP platform mm -hmm. that you built. Yeah, mm -hmm. what 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 is the NLP platform that you built? Uh, so uh, um, this is a project called Elite E L I T. So it's short for Evolution of Language and Information Technology. Okay. Um, we call this evolution because I think the way that people are doing language technology has to be evolved into the modern computing um, technology. So what I mean by that also is all these uh, natural language processing models lately, as I said, are making heavy use of deep learning. Mm -hmm. And deep learning is a neural network with multiple layers, and it requires um, a lot of computations. Because of this, um, to run, to train or decode any of the state-of-art models, you really need to have a very high computing GPU power. Uh, old days, when I was Actually, my PhD dissertation was purely focused on the efficiency of NLP models, how to make the model as small as possible to while you not losing accuracy. So you can actually run on your laptop. Mm -hmm. So all my models were able to you could run on your laptop as long as you have like three gigabytes of RAM. Okay. But now because uh, after all this neural network era, it's almost impossible to run this into your local machines. Mm. So um, a lot of researchers are having difficulties of making use of this technology. And when we're talking about the size, are we talking about mm. training or inference? Um, both. Okay. Both. So um, both, uh, for both training and inference, you do need a GPU to mm -hmm. run these neural network models. Mm -hmm. uh, at least if you want to run the state-of-the-art models, not the simple toy models, but okay. really good models. And in old days, before neural network with the linear models, it was still possible to optimize those models to make it very small, mm -hmm. so you, uh, without losing so much accuracy. So you could just run, any researchers like linguist or mm -hmm. historian, they can just run on their laptops. Okay. So, and these people still want to take advantage of all this latest technology that we are developing, there, which are tons and tons. But now it's literally impossible for anybody who doesn't have these high computing machines to run this kind of models. Mm. So, um, there is a solution for it, uh, which we found a solution from uh, cloud computing. Mm -hmm. So, it, um, the pl platform, the Elite pl platform that we are developing is a SaaS um, architecture. Mm -hmm. So we are uh, bringing all our um, natural language processing models to the cloud. So anybody in the world can actually call this as a web API. Okay. Just like the way you use Google search, you can just um, send your text and it will um, send you back your NLP result um, with a simple like HTTP call. And so is this a generic platform that you can then plug in these different projects as right. you know the types you know the the calls that you would make and right. you would get back okay right. and what we are, so that so what i just described about web web api and saas uh, environment that was the original intention for our lab so because mm -hmm. we actually start having so much um, needs of running these nlp models mm -hmm. So we actually developed the SaaS, pro, uh, SaaS architecture for ourselves first. Mm -hmm. So my students can actually just use that uh, without installing anything on their local machine sense. But um, we try to bring that up to the cloud so everyone in the world can actually use it. Um, mm -hmm. And thanks to AWS who has been supporting us for the, um, making this happen. But now the intention actually became much more interesting. Mm -hmm. So the uh, motivation at the moment now is we want to invite all NLP community uh, people to contribute their models to this cloud. Okay. So this is actually huge because um, how many papers do you think are getting um, published every year to like top three um, conferences? NLP or? Yeah, NLP, like top three conferences in NLP. Uh, gosh, I, how many papers a year to the top three conferences in NLP? 
2,500? <laughs> Still a thousand, right? Yeah, I, I didn't do the count myself. <laughs> but uh, if you, you actually, got me here sweating. <laughs> you know, yeah, the I didn't do the count. Um, but if you actually count even the your workshop papers, and all NLP, I, I would imagine like 5,000 of those. Yeah. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, and every single paper basically claims they have the best model of some sort, <laughs> right? right? Otherwise, right. it wouldn't be published. Right. So every paper has uh, has developed some kind of model that has some value. Mm -hmm. How many of them are actually getting used? Mm -hmm. Right, but less than few percent. Mm -hmm. So um, why is that though? These PhD students are spending at least five years of their life dedicated to develop these models. Mm -hmm. And after they graduate, nobody uses it. So I, I think this is an issue, and it's a very depressing issue, uh, to me at least, mm. because I want all like the models that we develop are has to be getting used in some sense, but it's not getting used at all, right? Uh, so yeah, it's just, it strikes me that some of that issue is mm -hmm. accessibility, and you know, mm -hmm. cloud and platforms address mm -hmm. that, but you know, there's also the assumptions that the model mm -hmm. makes, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them are rather limiting for right. actual use. <laughs> actual, uh, excellent, uh, that's an excellent point. That's why I want to actually open up the free platform for mm -hmm. people to actually show off your model actually works well. Okay. Right? Um, so, yes, you have proved that your model has value in your paper mm -hmm. in this sense, but does it actually do the right thing for real application or your application? Mm -hmm. So if they, um, if the developers or the researchers truly believe their model has value, mm -hmm. they can deploy their model to our platform, mm -hmm. and anybody in the world can test it out mm -hmm. for them and see, okay, this model actually does work really well. Mm -hmm. Then it gets promoted. Mm -hmm. So we will actually have to uh, show the ranking of the usage of the models as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, anybody in the world uh, can um, actually see, okay, this model does well for this kind of thing. And we can actually include to the discussion forum to see, okay, this model didn't do well for this genre, but this genre it did exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. So users can actually write their reviews about this. Mm -hmm. Just like that's what the technology should be, mm -hmm. right? For when you have a new phone, Right? When you have new technology, there's so many reviewers write the reviews about it. Right? Sure. But our, um, in academic world, what happens is you submit a paper, you, uh, the paper gets reviewed by three reviewers, and that was it. Mm -hmm. Later on, people forget about it. <laughs> but um, actual usage can be now reviewed by people. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think, a very exciting part. Also, another part that I really want to focus on is I believe there are a lot of models that are really good but are not getting published for some reason. Mm -hmm. So for many different reasons. We all know this. Uh, sometimes this review system doesn't work on some authors. So And also another thing is somebody actually is not really intending to invent some algorithm, but they replicate someone else's work but happen to have a better performance. And the academic conferences don't allow you to really write a papers about this, mm -hmm. replicating someone else's work. Um, there are some venues, but usually it's not as valued. Mm -hmm. But now these people can actually deploy all their models to our platform. Then they can actually show, okay, so I use the same algorithm, but my model actually works more efficiently or better in some sense. So please take a um, try out and see if it actually works well. So it actually opens the door to the developers and researchers to show off how well uh, of engineering or like researches they have done uh, and prove that to the world uh, from the practical point of view. How does a researcher format their model mm -hmm. to submit it to your platform? Right. So, um, so I try so many different ways. So I had a, I have an NLP platform called it used to be called Clear NLP. Now it's called NLP 4J. Okay. So this um, platform has been used quite a bit by industry and academics. So I used to get um, like at least five hundred downloads every month about mm -hmm. this software. So it was it was a huge project. Um, the lesson I learned from that is you should not force developers to um, write their code into some kind of architecture. Mm -hmm. They're not going to follow. They have their own architecture already, and they're not going to follow whatever you think is the best for them, right? So I'm going to give complete freedom to develop, 
You can write your model in any way you want. The only thing that I want to standardize is the I.O. format. Input and output format, which in natural language processing is pretty standard. The input is text, mm -hmm. right? Output is um, some kind of generated labels that you have. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, we are putting, given the input text, you are actually generating a dictionary um, that has a label of your task. So um, once that part is standardized, then all these mark models can actually even work together. So this is another unique part about our platform, or rather about natural language processing. A lot of models needs to work together. They're right. not working independently. Right. So this is a very unique thing. And um, because of this, if you actually standardize their IPO, I, I, IO format, they can actually take advantage of all the other models uh, and extract features from those models to make even better models. Mm -hmm. So I think and from the like um, research and user point of view, they can call any of, they can choose any of the models that's deployed to the platform. And um, you can actually try out which one works better for you. And uh, the best thing is you don't even have to install anything on your machine. Mm -hmm. So you can just call it up from the web and get all the results. So is, is the, the developer, the researcher, are they zipping up a, a Python folder or whatever? Mm -hmm. Are they like zipping something up and maybe some kind of JSON to tell you like where they need to get their right. IO or is it containers or right. like what's the actual format of the algorithms that they're submitting? Right. So um, we are, we um, have released uh, SDK um, as of yesterday. So we have SDK for Python. Oh, wow. You did a big launch here at uh, yeah. AWS? <laughs> well, we didn't, make, we didn't make an official announcement. Oh, okay. Uh, but um, the package is on, on the release now. So okay. uh, people can use it. They don't know uh, where the link is probably. <laughs> so as soon as I go back to Atlanta, I'm going to actually try to make a big announcement about this. Okay. But um, yeah, so we have SDK um, that provides you abstract classes, basically. Okay. So there's, uh, as a matter of fact, there's only one abstract class with four abstract functions. Mm -hmm. And that's all that we are asking you to overwrite. Got it. So you can completely independently develop your model. And it sounds very Java-ish. Yeah. <laughs> I'm coming from yeah. object-oriented programming background. Right, right, so it's right. not really Python-like. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I get that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so we do for, uh, we have an environment uh, developed for both Python and Java. So if okay. you are a Java programmer, you can just submit. And that is also another great thing about cloud computing, right? So now these models that's written in either Python or Java can work together mm -hmm. because it will be connected by the network and communicating between the AWS uh, instances is really fast. Mm. So. Right. Do, do you have a web page for it yet? That yes. Can um, find? The project is called Elite, so, uh, and the web page is elite.cloud. Oh, nice. So E-L-I-T dot cloud. All right. Sounds interesting. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me about what you're up to. It was uh, really interesting stuff. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, time flies. I it was it was very exciting. So. <laughs> Thanks, Gio. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. Thank you. All right, everyone. That's our show for today. For more information on Gino or any of the topics covered in this episode, visit twimlai.com/talk/206. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.